Did you do anything last night? You didn't get back to me, so I'm assuming you must have been having a great time. <laughs> uh, it was actually more the fact the amount of trick or treaters that were knocking on my door. Like it was oh, a conveyor cute. belt, and like you end up like there's always more than one of them, so you feel like you're inclined to chat to them, and then suddenly like. <sighs> Your, their mums come peering out the corner and suddenly you're chatting to them too so I don't know if that's just me or if that's because um as a kid I grew up in a pub like above because my parents worked my yeah. dad was the manager and my mum worked and so they were both managers before we were born I've got a brother um so that like, we kind of missed out on the old trick-or-treating because okay you live in a pub so that no no one really comes and knocks on so <laughs> now I live by myself it's and obviously you know the last two years of covid like now it, it was a really new experience okay fascinating i did have a couple of things written down that i think it'd be curious to discuss usually i'll, I'll i don't usually i really enjoy these things as being just a genuine authentic like chat and just having ideas about things to discuss and, and kind of like seeing where the conversation goes because yeah. I, I don't want it to be like an interview and I have no idea how to interview people. It's more just like, I love the idea that like, if you have a tangent that you think, oh, but this leads to this, leads to that, leads to that. I love yeah. that. And I'm, I'm yeah. all about that. And if you've read any of the posts that I've ever done, it's almost like I go into it with an idea and then I start ranting and then I forget what I'm trying to say and I make it yeah. something else. Um, I actually made a really good friend here. Um, he was an American doing some work in climate change. And, you know, having some conversations with him was really quite funny because he always managed to say, but to bring it back to your original point, Stubbsy. And when he said that, I thought, no one's ever remembered my original point. I can't <laughs> remember my original point. And it stuck with me. It's been like, this is a good communicator. This is a good listener. Um, and that was something that I was like, if I'm going to have these kinds of conversations, listening is probably going to be a, a thing to, to work on because I do get carried away with with ranting sometimes and I've got to catch myself and be like, hang on, people aren't pe pe people don't want to listen to me. But uh, I thought a, a good place to start would be, uh, I think, just a bit about your story going from like, you know, junior to say, you know, professionally contracted, playing for your country, Um and just we can sort of start to find some things in there to kind of discuss. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, so as I just mentioned, I've got a twin brother. So he was probably a big part in how I started playing cricket because sort of back in the day, like now there's like chance to shine and like really good sort of initiatives to get girls playing cricket. But I was probably just, just before, like it was starting to get rolled out in, in some schools kind of thing but it was very hit and miss mm. so it was my brother that actually started playing I was big I was football mad like I wanted to play football played that that took up most of my time and then he started playing went to the local club my dad used to play but quit the job etc etc so it was kind of my brother that kind of sort of made me realize what cricket was we started playing in the back garden mm. I'd go childcare duties I'd go and sit there while you went to training and then eventually just sort of joined in and that, that's how it started and then I Brilliant. played with him for probably like two years kind of you know football was still very much the focus I was doing pretty well with that and cricket was just like a nice it was sort of the other thing that I did but it meant that I got to spend time with my brother because as everyone knows with siblings it can be a little bit hit and miss how well you get on and at different stages one day your best date you know maybe two hours you're fighting oh, and pulling gosh. each other's hair out so so yeah it's just quite a nice thing that we sort of did as a family because um like mum would come down and sort of you know she's quite a chatty person so she mm, she sort of just brought her around um so yeah so that's kind of how it started and then um my brother got into the district for Dorset um and I ended up starting training with them and I didn't really know there was any girl stuff going on because I didn't play for a girls club and then I went straight into a district boys team which right. probably was a little bit challenging in itself because you know you got sort of under 15 boys going sort of who is this and then I'm like mm. oh Tom can you help me out <laughs> um so that was that was quite a good learning yeah. experience to sort of work out the dynamics of a team quite early on um and then it was actually the um coach also coached the women's county team for Dorset oh. um his name was Rob and he actually was the one that was like oh like we've got the girls team county like would you like to come and play and I initially said no because I was thinking I'm having mm -hmm. a great time here. Like I feel challenged. Like why do I need to go and do that? Like, I'm quite happy. And then eventually I yeah. got it myself and you know went off. And that's sort of how I got into the county setup. Um, mm. And then apparently I didn't know at the time, but that's where I first got scouted through England um, at sort of under 15s level, maybe okay. under first last year of under 13s. 
Um, so that's sort of how it started. Um, you get all told these, that's what I always find mad when you get told these stories, when you're sort of a big girl and you're 17, 18, and my dad's going, oh, I had chats with this person when you were just a little bubble. I'm like, when? Were they there? I didn't know. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's freaky because they're always there. And it's actually pretty cool how you sort of see how you sort of get spotted and then everyone, you get like a little scouting pool, don't you? So mm. I've always found that quite cool. Um, so yeah, so I went into the county at Dorset and then we moved house um, into Hampshire. So I just moved over to Hampshire County. And that's probably the start of where I started to take cricket a little bit more seriously. Um, Ron Hodgson was the coach and I've actually grown up with him. So he was the under-15s coach for Hampshire. And then the way it worked, he then got the under-17s job. He then he got the women's job. So mm. I've ended up sort of growing up as him as my coach and he's been yeah. a massive part in sort of my sort of that journey because mm. at 18 I was making my debut. So I've got a lot to thank him for. Um, yeah. And it's quite nice that we did that together and we ended up winning a couple of things along the way. So that's pretty Terrific. cool. Um, and then sort of the Super League started, I suppose that's like the big thing that sort of created, obviously it doesn't run anymore, but I think mm. for the women's game, the Super League was really really good because it was that sort of change from county cricket which was you know the best thing at the time to suddenly this competition where you're getting overseas and I remember you know my first season in the Super League I was playing for the Vipers um Charlotte Edwards is my captain Lydia Greenway's yeah. playing Aaron Brindle's playing and I'm a 16 year old kid girl this is bloody cool and I'm, like, <laughs> I'm just trying to I'm being a sponge like I was everyone thought I was quite quiet and anyone that knows me knows that I'm not very quiet at all yeah I was just sort yeah. of you know like this is this is crazy <laughs> and I hadn't really been around much like Hampshire at the time um we were probably quite everyone probably turned up and thought they'd beat us but we were probably mm. always the underdog that ended up doing quite well um so yeah so I'm playing the Super League and maybe three games in I'm bowling at least Perry I'm going jeez like how have I ended up here um, and that's kind of where I started to realise I never really thought I was any good at cricket. I kind of just, it has always been something I did with my brother and sort of played with my mates. And it sounds stupid. I, I'm very aware. You but don't, but I, I love I this. I, quite, I, I knew I was quite good at football. Um, and I was doing England age group stuff. But like cricket had always been that sort of release. And I, I didn't really particularly like school. So any excuse, yeah, I'll go to training. Yeah, I'll go and play this Tuesday night match. Whatever it was, I'd be, I'd be there. Yeah. Um, but it was it was never something I really sort of took seriously. And then sort of reflecting after these games where I'm actually going, I'm actually playing like proper cricket. And it, it sounds stupid. Um, and then Mark Robinson, the uh, coach, England head coach at the time, mm. he was doing a radio thing. A radio commentary um and after that game uh my dad told me oh Robinson was on the radio and he was talking about you and I'm initially going oh god like what, <laughs> what is he saying like it can't be anything good um and it turns out that he was he's I think his words were I'm trying to prize her away from football like she's got a bit of talent like what I see and I was just like mm. And like as, as I said, football was my thing. So like I'd watched a bit of the England women, but you know, I wasn't a religious watcher. I hadn't gone to many games to watch them. And it was this sort of mm. alien thing that I kind of knew about, but didn't really sort of know. Um, whereas I think nowadays it's, it's just everywhere. But even when I was a kid, mm -hmm. you know, I, I grew up watching test cricket with my dad. Like, I absolutely adore test cricket. And if my body allows it, I'd love to play it one day. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it was kind of this really strange sort of, I didn't really know that much about it. Um, so the Super League was a really big thing for me just to get that exposure. And like mm. I said, I didn't watch too much cricket sort of live at the time because mm. I, was, I was probably playing it, to be honest. So I was playing football at the park or I was out with my mates, whatever I was doing. So I think the Super League was key for me. Um, and then sort of hearing the head coach was a real turning point. I was like, I should probably take this seriously. I, I think even sort of my attitude... Like my attitude to training is pretty good, but cricket, yeah. it was always, I never saw it as, you know, I just saw it as fun. Like I was going to under 15 so like England camps for cricket and you'd, you'd go on a Friday, come back on a Sunday and I'm just thinking this is fantastic. And like, it turns out that like, like now and then, because obviously the football season, cricket season, I'd have to, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to miss that camp because it's still the football season. And then mm. you had to sort of like pick and choose mm. and like, England thought that, you know, I did, just didn't like training or like, I didn't like playing 
and I had this conversation maybe three years after the fact when I quit football but I was like oh no no I was actually just playing football because it was a Saturday <laughs> like so it was it was just kind of this I kind of just stumbled along into it I don't it's so interesting I never really thought it was maybe it was naivety I don't know but I never really saw it as a oh like if I'm in the under 15s I'm gonna try and do this I'm gonna try and do that Mm. I, just, I was just enjoying playing and I think we'll go into it later but like that, that enjoyment mm. of playing was like that's massive for me um, yeah. it's probably something that I've lost a little bit just because of everything that's happened but yeah so Super League brilliant and then Mark Robinson I was actually on a canal boat like just on a little bit of a holiday after the Super League and he's rang me up signal's terrible I'm on, I'm in, I'm on a river I ain't got a clue where I am and he's like, gone oh, like, would you be interested? Like, we want you to come down to Chelmsford. Um, we've got a like four day practice, three day practice, whatever it was, because they were going off to the ashes. And he wanted to be to come down. And I'm like, mm. shit at a brick. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not sure, Robbo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really unsure. Um, and he was like, no, no, like, come. And he was probably like, I really, really, I was like, normally I'm a bit like, yeah, absolutely, I'll do anything. Yep. Name mm-hmm. it, I'll probably go. And I was, I was like, oh, like this seems a bit serious. Like, I'm not, not sure. Like, and I've like gone down. I've like, and I didn't really know anyone. So like now you get a lot of interchange. You play against them. So like, it's it's a bit more of a family orientated. Mm. Um, but at the time, I, I couldn't t- I, c- I couldn't tell you one. Like, I knew Sophie Eccleston, and that was yeah. pretty much it. Um, so it was quite scary. And then I've ended up having a net sort of with the coaches, and then. Ali Maiden, the assistant at the time, he's gone, I'm just sat there sort of minding my own business. Sarah Taylor's playing football manager on her like little thing. And I'm thinking, I, I love football manager. So I'm like, <laughs> just sat next to her, like, she's playing as Arsenal. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, hate her for it. Yeah. Like, terrible team. And I'm just like, kind of like over her shoulder, like, God, I absolutely love football manager. Um, and obviously like Sarah Taylor, 16, 17, like, that's cool. Yeah. So just going to play football manager with her. Um, and then like, Ali Maiden's tapped me on the shoulder. It's freezing. I've got like three jumpers on. He's like, do you want to go out and be night like, watch with it? I'm like, yeah, all right then. <laughs> Shit, my bag's packed. All right, okay, like get my get my stuff. Um, and then I've ended up like Catherine Brunt steaming at me, and I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. like that'll do. <laughs> and then like I think I ran Alex Hartley out by the end. She was batting with me, and maybe maybe the last over, like I thought I could get because I was thinking oh, no. oh, I should probably be on strike tomorrow morning. So I was like, oh, I think there's a cheap quick cheeky quick single at mid-wicket there wasn't she got ran out I don't know if it's my fault or her still to the day but <laughs> like, so so yes and then I bowled a bit the next day in the game which mm-hmm. was pretty cool Red Bull never going to complain really so cool I was, in, I was in my brother's whites because I didn't have any whites just sort of Terrific. borrowed so so there we are and that's kind of and then they went off to the ashes and I was like oh that's done right football season let's go kind of that was kind of I genuinely thought that I did not think anything was going to come of it and then they've come back mm. I'm trolled, um and Robin phoned me up again and was like oh can you come to our winter training mm. and I'm like sick yeah okay <laughs> um and I've kind of like the way I saw it I was just like well I'm here I don't really know why I'm here I feel like I'm just being a bit of a net bowler like that's calm I'm gonna have a great yeah. time so it's just kind of like again I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that, you know, there was a series, a trial series against India and Australia in India, like the, the other side of the new year. And I'm just, I'm just sort of playing a bit of football training. Like, this is pretty cool. And then I guess there's like these sofas at Loughborough, I feel like the top level above the cricket bit. Mm. And he's like, sat me down, which is, you know, we quite often had a chat. So I didn't think it was anything unusual. Yeah. Um, and he's like, oh, how would you feel about coming to India? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> He's like, oh, we, well, we want to take you to India. And I was like, why? <laughs> and he was like, I was like, <laughs> genuinely, I was like, why? <laughs> um, and it was basically, so he wanted me to come to sort of get to know the girls better, yeah. getting used to the environment, what it looks like to tour kind of thing. And sort of, basically, I had absolutely no chance of playing. Right. That's what I took. I've gone home. I've, I've, I've like phoned mum and dad up. Like, oh, they want to take me to India. Like, I don't know why, but it's really cool. <laughs> um, and I'm like, oh, so I'm not like I genuinely no chance of playing. Um, I was just like, India seems pretty cool. 
Mm. Like, I'm not sure I'm gonna like the food. Turns out I really like Indian food. That's cool. Never really had it before. Mm, um, and I was like, oh, like, it might be a bit scary. Really. I, don't know. I haven't really been away to anything. Like, I've been to Spain. I've been to Portugal, but I haven't really been anywhere that that fun. Um, so I've gone away, and like, it was an absolute blast. And I've run drinks for the first two warm up games, and the last one, like, team gets announced the night before, not playing no biggie mm. you know I slept like a baby like didn't expect anything and then literally so the games were getting played so early because it was so hot mm. um and like, I'm, I'm I've got better at being a morning person but I'm a terrible <laughs> I wondered person. that I, <laughs> I wondered that like I just I just <laughs> when you were like oh should we have a morning coffee <laughs> then jump on the court I was like this is my guy yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so so I've just uh, I'm literally like, I'm eating uh, I'm like just I'm in my own little space like don't talk to me like I'll say morning like I'm nice enough but like I've j- I just need a little bit of time I need a bit of time to function and it, like Robbo's tapped me up on the shoulder and he's like you're in the 11 like you're playing and I was like no I'm not like, you've you told us yesterday I was like and then he was like no no like you're in I was like oh shit that changes things okay <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, I just I think there's a massive difference between like you wear the you wear the badge to run drinks and like mm. that's kind of cool you got a bib over you like it doesn't really feel the same and then suddenly I was like oh actually I'm gonna play a game and I don't care if it's a warm up game like yeah. this is a game where I'm gonna be England colours playing with the other England players mm-hmm. and that's pretty cool definitely and, like in my haste like, I forgot playing trousers like I, I was I was a bit of a mess like, it was all a bit last minute so I was like oh okay but anyway get to the game and just like played and. I got a hat trick and no one was more surprised than me. Right. Like it was, I remember, so ADR was playing Alice Davis and Riches and um, I remember, and like, I've just celebrated, I've just run to her, I didn't know what to do. Like, <laughs> we, we laugh about it many times. Like it was just, I was kind of just like doing this, honestly. It was just, and it was just a warm up game. But to yeah. me, that was like the best thing that had ever happened. Um, yeah. And after that, it was a little bit of a blur. Like I played the first game with the Tri-Series um, and I'm just like suddenly I'm bowling at Lisa Healy and Mandana and mm. I was out of my depth like more than happy to say it like, I'd gone from playing Div 3 Hampshire cricket some boy honestly the men's cricket and the boys cricket that I played that gave me the foundations to be able to okay. do half good 100% because it gave me like men's cricket it's giving you the challenges like you've got someone smacking you off vaguely good length and mm. it's gone for six and you're like oh, what do I do now and then you've got to learn whereas I think didn't really have that anywhere else at that time okay. so I think that was what got me into a place where I could compete and try to compete but yes I felt I was like I mean I had a couple of drop catches which would have made the figures look a bit better mm. but like I was I think I did all right I got run out like you know what it was my first first experience and I, I swung a ball I bowled a decent pace and I was like you know what that that's me done yeah like that's I'm, I'm happy with that like I feel like I've done the best I can Perfect. and at the time like cause, because I wasn't expecting to play we were doing a few like sort of, like, sort of having a little look at my action can I do a little bit of this a little mm. bit of that so I was in a little bit of a I, I think anyone that bowls knows that if you've sort of got a couple of things as you're trying to bowl it's you've either got to try I think the best thing is to try and forget those and just bowl but then sometimes it doesn't feel quite the same so I had that and that was probably your first experience of that was probably the first experience of bowling, not feeling sort of with, you're searching for rhythm. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So yeah, I look back on that now and go, yeah. <laughs> that so, I feel like and then kind of I played that summer, and then yeah. I got injured. Yeah. So I played that summer. I didn't start the summer. Um, they were picking other bowlers, which is calm. I was quite happy running drinks. It was again, it was still pretty cool. I was just quite happy posturing. Like I remember it was more traumatic, like driving. So at the time we didn't have coach. So right. like, I remember one particular journey. We've either come from Essex or Kent, one of the two, and we've driven to Bristol. And I'm in this like Kia Picanto, like 05 plate. It's got a different coloured bumper. Like poor <laughs> Kia, she couldn't, she couldn't do it. And yeah. I've just turned up to this car park and it's taken me like six, seven hours to get to Ooh. Bristol and like maybe, maybe longer. Like the M25 was just chocker and it was just carnage. And like, that was the worst thing that happened to me that summer. Like I, I got hit for six. It doesn't like, it was, I, was, I was just loving it. And like when I got the call, I just wanted to play and I had that freedom. And um, oh. that's probably when I 
bold or right and then but I don't have that freedom less so mm. and then injuries and that's you to be fair you can fast forward to to now really because not much has changed how many injuries have you had Did, so I've had four stress fractures but I've rehabbed so basically the 21 22 winter I've had to mm. rehab my previous stress because it relapsed so it wasn't a right. new stress fracture yeah. but I had to go through the whole eight month rehab again and I didn't bowl a single ball during the 2021 20, season. Fuck. So I did a 20 over the winter of 2020, 21, did a rehab. Mm. And then it was May, I had a routine scan. So I was getting these routine MRIs just to see how my back was doing and everything was fine. And then suddenly it was maybe two weeks, 10 days before the first game of the season for regional team which and I sort of targeted that as a comeback and been mm. really happy that I was in a place that I felt I was going to be okay. You know, it would take a couple of games to sort of build up, but I felt in a decent place and then had routine scan, back swollen, all flared up, right, don't bowl. So we tried different things. We tried to minimise what I was doing. So didn't bowl at all, like stopped doing running sessions, did off feet, bike sessions, okay. sort of kept it like that another scan still swollen not going down got worse okay so then literally scaled right back and I batted for 20 minutes maybe and I fielded take enough catches to make you feel like you can play a game I was like okay cool yeah and that's that's all I did so that that was my prep for sort of the last bit of regional cricket before we played the 100 and then the 100 I mean I think it's everyone's dream just to rock up and play but I hated every second of it I right. couldn't train properly I couldn't I couldn't physically feel like I was ready for a game. Yeah. And I was, I, I was li- no word of a lie. I was literally rocking up on a Tuesday, play a game, sit on my ass, play the next game. I, oh, it sounds fantastic, but I, I hated it. It's just not me. You seem um, like an active then, person. Yeah. Could, yeah. Yeah. I got, I got shut down four weeks, five weeks. And then we had another scan. The swelling's nearly gone. If we wait a little bit, I reckon that'd be good for you. So mm. we waited another three weeks, maybe, then start the whole rehab. And touch wood, this year's been awful. It's not been fun, mm. but like, hopefully the back is good, which means I can build from here into next season. It's a tough one. And like, I, I love this whole story you've told. Like, <laughs> there was a couple of questions that I had in mind that I think would be kind of cool. Like, you know, say what you think are your keys to success and you know you had this enjoyment also talking a bit about um i guess a bit about like your own success and i loved it actually one question i did have was like if i was your brother i would be saying that you're only that good because of me (laughs) and i would be taking all the credit (laughs) totally what i'd be doing yeah to be fair the um one of the only positives of covid if you can say that was that we actually so I had to get some training in, and mm. he, he still plays. He's a pretty handy keeper. Okay. Um, I reckon if his batting was better, he could have played a pretty good level. Okay. Um, so I managed to, I had a bowl at him, batted at him. So that was quite nice to sort of bring us back mm. sort of to where we sort of, and it was literally we were bowling down the park, like no strip, not even an Astro. Like he was at the edge of the Astro batting, so like it wasn't terrible. But we were literally like just bowling on grass. Like dad was there, mum was there, like the dogs were there. Like it was, yeah. that, that was really nice. That's really sweet. I like those kinds of moments. And, and, and I know you talked about the sibling kind of stuff. And I think for me as well with my younger brother, like that that built us into, you might say, the, the athletes we became. Now, we never went on to play for our country, so we must have been half decent. But a jack of all trades, you know, if that makes sense. And the full quote is like, a jack of all trades is oftentimes better than a master of one. I don't know if you ever knew the, the whole quote, because often people say like a jack of all trades is not necessarily a good thing. But in reality, yeah, I was going to say, I've not often heard it's better yet. than a master of one. Um, but I was curious actually to, to get a bit more of your thoughts on on what you believe is like, you know, really important, say, team culture for success. Mainly because I had a bit of a thought a while back about, and maybe it's Australian kind of um, attitude where it's a bit, bit angrier, a bit fierier, a bit more like, you know, you should be hurting, you know. And uh, I've oftentimes seen, you know, people get, you might say, yelled at for like not feeling bad enough. And uh, mm-hmm. I've sat back and thought, I don't know if that's how you should be approaching it. Like if it, it, everyone after say a loss or everyone's going to have their own approach 
you know, and me personally, like I would try to like not have an emotional response to it, try to face reality as, as hard as I can, learn what I can. And then I'm like, my mind's already into the training that that's coming next. Me sitting here like wallowing in self-pity or yelling or venting, like, I don't know, you know, that's not for me. I'm not going to expect somebody else to adopt that. But I have someone who's played in some successful teams. I'm curious to get your thoughts, what you believe, as also as a professional, right? Because here's the here's, here's the nuance to it. You know, there are expectations. And cricket's also a sport where you get selected on performance. But if you go out there, like, I've got to perform, you put this pressure on yourself. So it's like, how can I create those performances without almost like thinking about the performances through a culture that allows me to do all this? Yeah, I think I'm definitely someone a little bit like you. I don't sort of sit there and I'm not, I don't show my emotions very often, which, you know, there's pros and cons to that. And I'm, so I'm, I'm very much like next training. Like I got absolutely hit out of the park one game and I'm literally, I'm in the net as soon as, you know, the, the mm. chats are wrapped up, everyone's sort of calm and down. I'm like, I've grabbed a coach, I'm off, like, I need to do this, bowl a few balls, whatever it is, That that's me. Yeah. But I also think it's important for a successful team is to allow that individuality mm. because not everyone's the same. The personalities aren't the same. That's, that's a strength. And I think it's mm. important that you embrace that and you don't try and sort of push everyone into a certain way because whether you think it's the right or wrong way, it's, it's not going to work for everyone. And yeah. I think the successful teams, they yeah. embrace that. And I think when you all have a common goal, I think that's a really key thing is that when you have that common goal and you're going towards a certain direction, that doesn't matter because mm. everyone's believing that what the other person doing and they're looking at the person next to them, they're trying to do everything possible to get to there. Yeah. And I think when you have that open sort of environment, that that's very key. And it's when you actually get a little bit closed off, you sort of go in different directions. That's mm. when it doesn't work because then suddenly you get, and everyone that's playing team, you go, well, what are they doing? Sort of, oh, why aren't they doing that? Are they doing this? What are they yeah. thinking? <clears throat> and you sort of get that sort of, doubt that sort of creeps and I think in sort of small team environments when there's only sort of 15 16 of you like you can't you can't allow that to spread because it'll spread very quickly so I think the key thing is having that sort of open and when you chat to each other so I think when you can have those honest chats whether mm. you know someone's not really pulling their weight or you know they're kind of they've rocked up a few times late but it's actually, it's how you approach that conversation because, yeah. you know, maybe a family member dies, you don't know. So you it's how you approach that because if you just yeah. go at someone, like, it could explode and, you know, that person could go further away and sort yeah. of put add more fuel to the fire. Yeah. So I think it's being able to spend enough time with each other. And I think as, a, as an England team, you've actually got a real benefit because we do have that hub at Loughborough. And it's a bit of a love-hate relationship because you do these four-week blocks, for example, and they're absolutely putrid and everyone wants to go home. Right. But it's actually those tough times, are actually the things that when you get onto a pitch against an India and Australia and you, you know, you're back against the wall, that's when mm. you come together. And I think that's when you start creating moments in a game to change the game. And I think when you're very separate and you haven't had those experiences together and you haven't had difficult conversations with each other, I don't mm. think that can happen. So I love that. that. That's what I think. It's good. You've just proved me right. Perfect. That's all I needed. All right, I can go now. <laughs> all right, off we go. <laughs> but no, I love that. And and it makes a lot of sense. And, and I kind of more sat back from it as a, as I, don't know, I say coach and mentor, but like I've got people that I say, like I've got an open line, line of communication. If you want to share with me a struggle that that's, that's happening in your life, drop me a line. Like happy to kind of be there. And when you start to get a bit more, or when people start to, I guess, open up a little bit more, you can start to see where a lot of their their struggles come from. And I had a few people like privately message me, and some of them were like pro players, um, say like, what you said and what you've just expressed is like nail on the head. When you get into some of these cultures where like, yeah, because of that, you might say a culture that starts to be a bit poison, you can really ruin talented players. And instead of them going out there, and what I loved about you telling your story, it just seemed like you were just going with the flow. It's almost like you couldn't create any pressure because you were just too busy enjoying yourself. And I love that. Yeah. And if you someone had to put that pressure on you, 
in a negative way, all of a sudden, like someone that gets the best out of themselves, and you mentioned how you get the best out of yourself, you've now changed that. And then you never know the impact that you're going to have on someone, you know, and that lasting impact might go long beyond cricket, you know, which is where I love using fast bowling and cricket as like a, a vehicle to hopefully share some lessons that apply broadly into life. Just like I, I, I used my COVID lockdown to, to maybe take guitar a bit more seriously. Now, when you're playing guitar, you can't have a stiff wrist. So I've got an idea about what relaxation is, especially in my hand. Now, I don't bowl left-handed, but I could apply that and be like, you know, imagine I'm, I'm playing guitar, so to speak, and that relaxes me. So we all have lessons in life that we can apply to cricket. We just haven't yet found those kinds of links. Just like if you give someone a negative experience in, in cricket, that can apply more broadly to their life. And like you said, we don't know what people are, are going through, especially outside of life. And I mean, I'm thrilled to hear that you've been in such a great environment for so long. Like, that's really exciting. And yeah. And I think I've actually had sort of two ends of that. So I've had the really good experiences, but actually probably when, when you're injured, um, it's mm. actually a little bit more difficult yeah. because you are doing different things to other people and there's, you know, you're injured and then you're injured again and it's, oh, maybe they're not doing the right things. And I can promise you now I've been doing the bloody right things. It's just not been happening. Yeah. Like it's, it's just one of those things. And you, you actually, when you're injured, it's a lonely place. Yeah. You do, you, you get split away from everything that you sort of want to be there and you sort mm-hmm. of those moments because the moment, you know, there's some great moments that happen on the pitch, but it's the stuff that happens off it when you're on tour or sort of wherever you are. It's those moments that kind of keep you around and you remember fondly. And those mm. are the bits that you don't get when you're injured because you're in the gym by yourself with the S&C coach. Yeah. You're going for a run by yourself. Like it gets suddenly something that's very sociable, you know, training, you're sort of always yeah. together. Um, suddenly it's a big flip. And I've said it before, like I'm, I don't go and cycle miles and miles because I'm an introvert and that's what gets me going. It, it doesn't, mm. I hate I hate anything I have to do by myself. Um, it's that team stuff and that's, what you lose and then trying to get back into that is quite difficult yeah. because it's, it's like when you're at school and you've, you've got all your mates and the dynamics are the way they are, then you go off ill for five days and then suddenly, you know, everything's changed mm-hmm. and you're trying to claw that back. And it always felt like I was playing catch up. I was trying to get like, what was, what happened two weeks ago? I, I didn't have a clue. Yeah. So it was just trying to find your way again into the team and unfortunately for me because of the recurrent injuries mm. I never quite got there so I always felt on the peripheral so, so after feeling sort of very involved yeah. and in I felt for a very long time that I was on the peripheral and I was trying to get in and that, that's a very difficult place because that's suddenly when I'm not going with the flow I'm not yeah. you know doing things because I enjoy doing them it's Rehab's a slog, everyone knows that, mm-hmm. especially the long-term ones, which unfortunately I've had a few of. It's very difficult. And then you haven't really got anywhere to go other than to try and keep going forwards. And it's probably something I didn't address soon enough. I was just, I'm a bit, just like plow through. Whereas actually, mm-hmm. if you probably start speaking a little bit earlier, then you can actually find help through that. Yeah. Because people don't know if you, you can, you can guess and you can try and be there. But until you actually sort of open up a little bit it can just look like it can look very different to how you think it looks yeah especially the image that you express you know when people say like how are you going often often it's like you know in these social interactions when someone says like how are you going in, inside you're thinking oh my god i really want to have a conversation about this but like you know i'm just going to say i'm fine and then that can kind of build and build and build and and, and usually you find there's two types of people if well, I don't want to break it down or reduce the two types, but those that, you know, do go quite internal or those that do go, I guess, a little bit mad. <laughs> and then you're just like, you know, venting everything to everyone. And I can imagine that, you know, that that injury place, having gone through a couple of myself, and I, I did hurt myself a month ago to the point where I couldn't stand up without being in excruciating pain. I, I, I think back to it now, it's still there, but I, I couldn't stand up and piss. <laughs> I was in agony. I had to, obviously. Like, I'm not going to pee the bed. But I sat there thinking, like, this is fucking ridiculous. And my life had gotten reduced to these four-hour blocks of when I'd, like, I'd take the pain medication and then I'd start to feel a bit better. I'd, st- I'd still only be able to lie in bed. And I remember, like, my mental health plummeted in a way that I'd never experienced it in my entire life. 
And it was quite shocking, I think, you know, and, and the loneliness that you kind of touched on was something that I think I'd experienced and just thought like, this is, this is yeah, so quite a challenge. I re- actually rehabbed during COVID. Mm. Um, so I stayed at a hotel on campus at Loughborough and I literally, I'd go to my gym session. I'd come back to the hotel, like no interaction. All my meals yeah. got delivered to me. I'd go for a walk with someone. I think that's it was good. what 20 minutes half hour that you're allowed yeah but like, that's once a day that's it and I was literally just in this hotel room I'd go to my session I'd come back and yeah, that was five nights a week and yeah. like, after that I was not the same didn't realize because yeah. I got so used to this for four months and then suddenly like, I got and then you know you think that you're getting you know that carrots at the end like that first regional game and then suddenly that's been taken away and I think that took took me quite a long it was almost like recovering like from that because I'd done yeah. so much to get to a place and then literally a week away, it was just, it was all for nothing. That's how it felt. Yeah. Like there was like literally there was no purpose anymore because I was like, I've just spent the entire winter like making a lot of sacrifices because I was petrified of getting COVID because that means I wouldn't be able to train and then the rehab, right. you know, that sets back a week, then another week. Mm. Like it's, it's difficult. And then, you just you're just like oh it's all all for nothing and I think that summer was very challenging and then to try and have that same mentality that had made my rehab so good the second time around so close without having Mm. any reward in the middle to go again like I I don't know how I've done it like people ask me how I've done it and I genuinely don't know well then I went well well, that was going to be my next question (laughs) But it's interesting. We'll, we'll, try. I mean, we'll try. Well, I mean, have, I mean, listening to you, like, it sounds like you are someone that just plugs away, you know? Like, maybe you get that from, like, the football side of things or, like, having to play against, you know, boys where you feel like you've almost, like, got something to prove, maybe. Um, yeah. But someone that's just, like, when, when, when there's nothing else and there's no answers, I guess you've just probably focused on the one thing you could control, um, which maybe also explains why you didn't have the understanding until later when you could maybe sit back and reflect um, and go, Oh, wow. Maybe there was something um, through there. It's like, but maybe there's there's a lesson in there, you know, when there's nothing else you can do, um, you may as well just plug away. And oftentimes I tell you to some of my um, players, like when you sit there and reflect, you can only, only reflect for so long. And it's wonderful listening to you talk about like, he almost like you've just been on this roller coaster that you haven't had time to, reflect too much but often what happens is like the good things they go in and out really quickly once you've processed all those what's left the bad things you might say the criticisms and then you can sometimes if you're in this moment and you're alone you can start to bring up things that might not even be real and then you start to create fears and doubts in the future which might then make it harder to rejoin the playing group Maybe that's just part of the process. But what I often tell people is like, this, this, this is why you need a hobby. This is why you've got to go and play guitar. This is why you've got to call your mum. This is why you've got to go and, you know, catch up with a friend. And, and COVID would have been one of those times where it's like, it's just so challenging. And for me, um, when I couldn't really get up and do the things that I think help my mental health, it deteriorated to a point where I was like, I'm sort of, I'm quite struggling here. And, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there wondering why for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> and that was it. So um, I'm curious to hear, like, I, th- I think that makes a, makes a lot of sense to hear. Like now, listening to your journey where it's like you've gone through the, you might say you've coasted through so nicely and enjoying life to, I'm guessing there was a point with the injury when it changed. You're also a professional athlete. And this is where I wondered too, like as a pro, it's probably different to, to, to find the enjoyment, even though it's so important because there's a lot more pressure. Now I'm guessing as well, there's a lot more media exposure. I don't know. It's also my question about the cultures, like what other influences kind of come into play. And then how do you go about handling all these and, and just getting the best out of yourself? But it does sound like you've yeah, gone I through it pretty well. Each each time you have the rehab, there's I think there's, there is a pressure to get back because yeah. I know certainly, I think it's a little bit different the more time passed, but certainly when I got that stress fracture straight after sort of the breakout year, if you want to call it, it felt like I need to, 
I need to get back because, you know, my place is going to go to somewhere else and I'm going to slip down this pecking order if I'm not careful. And I think there was certainly an emphasis to do everything right. And I think that's actually something that helped me at okay. that time was that that was a driver yeah. because I wanted to get back and I wanted to do it well so that I was in a good place for when I got back so that it, you know, I wouldn't, it wouldn't take a long time to sort of get back up to speed. Um, mm. So I think then that was probably a really good thing, but as the time passed and the injuries kept happening, mm. I wasn't getting anything in between. I wasn't playing much cricket and the cricket that I was playing, you know, I wasn't able to do to the standards that I strive to, right. which is always a challenge, you know, it's a whole new challenge. <laughs> but I think as the time, especially so this last, so the, the stress fracture, the last stress fracture um, during 2021 20, winter wow. was, felt, I didn't think I'd get any more field pressure more than that, because I thought hopefully it'd be the last rehab. Mm. But knowing that this was kind of like my contract was up, sort of the back end of that year leading up that I had to get back and then I yeah. had last summer and this summer to sort of play and be able to fight for my place because previously I felt like I hadn't been able to fight for that you know yeah. it's 15 contracts and I felt like I couldn't actually <laughs> you know put my hand up because I wasn't playing hmm. and when I was I was doing pretty shit and then so that was a big rehab for me was to so then I was thinking if I can build up this year have a really good year next year then I'll be in an okay place mm. and it wasn't you know it wasn't even I wasn't thinking get back into the England 11 it was play re regional wow. cricket play consistently mm. and see where I am at and unfortunately that didn't happen because I had that relapse yeah. and I knew from then it was I think I, I really struggled because I knew that time was just simply running out mm. and what's frustrating is I had that breakthrough year, but, and sometimes people say that I got fast tracks and maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but I'm competing. Catherine Brunt's playing, Anya Shopshaw's playing. You've got Kate Cross, you've got Tash, mm. Tash Farron. Like you've got these very good bowlers. And I don't think it can just be the coach that's going right. Well, we think she could be good in a few years. Right. Uh, let's yeah. get her in. I think I was competing for my place mm. and I was performing well enough to play. And then not to have an opportunity to perform and fight for my place, I think it's very difficult as a professional athlete because that, that's why you play the game, because yeah. you want to play in those games. And, you know, you want to, for me, I want to win games for whichever team I'm playing. And it, I just couldn't. Mm. And then when I was starting to play, I wasn't either I wasn't allowed to bowl, so I felt like half a player, or I was allowed to bowl at 60%, 70%, and the keeper's asking, geez, you bowl a bit slower than you used to. And I'm like... Oh, tell me about it. Yeah. Like, and, you know, for me, something as a bowler, like I wanted to swing a new ball and I wanted to bowl rockets. Mm -hmm. That's how that's how I wanted to play. I didn't, you know, I had a couple of slowies, but my first port of call was either to try and hit them or bowl it at their toes and then I'd go to slowies depending on the mm -hmm. scenario, whether the, what the pitch was doing. But that was always my first port of call. And then, you know, like 100 this year, I was bowling 8% slower balls. So not only as what, has, what got me to where I got to, you know, was, bowling at a relatively good pace and swinging the ball. Right. Well, I wasn't opening the bowling. So I was having to be a different bowler to perhaps, you know, my number one strength. Yeah. And I was also had absolutely no cricket behind me. I wasn't allowed to tear in. And I'm trying to do a role that, you know, I do my absolute best, but it's probably not, you know, it's not me. It's not what I've done the most. So then trying to, and you just feel like time slipping away. And mm -hmm. in the end, I knew that, I'd I'd not get my contracts and I couldn't do much about it and you also you, you feel like you don't deserve it right like you you know that you know you haven't played much cricket you've got all these players that are playing well like they deserve it you crack on and actually for me the best thing that I found out was relief because now I can just go where I can have a whole winter with a regional team and then hit the summer and there's no pressure I'm not coming back to a regional team mm. thinking shit I'm an England player like mm. I need to make sure I'm on it because you can't be on it when you, you're coming back and I think not having that pressure and just being able to play and find that enjoyment again yeah. I think that's going to do me wonders huge I think and it's interesting the I guess the journey of, of you know starting enjoying cricket obviously 
getting to a point where now the pressure starts to come on after you've, you know, bowled to Elise Perry, which I love. Like, I didn't realize I was good until I bowled to Elise Perry. That's going to be one of the best things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> but then to come at the other side, and I've always, I've always, I guess, you know, wanted to have this conversation with someone to be like, people might, like, like the life of a pro athlete is not the easiest thing because you take something you enjoy and now you got to do it for work. And now that you're being like paid to do it, there's the expectations, and then there's all the pressures that come along with, you know, like you said, time. Time's a great one because, like, there's always another thing coming up that you can then use that thing in the future to kind of create some sort of unhappiness in the in the present. And then you throw in something like COVID in there, which is like, I can only imagine, especially living alone, just like what that would have been like to go through. But like, I think you went sounds like you went through it in a way that just that 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 was like a blur. You know, like how you talked about part of the early career, career was kind of like a blur. There just wasn't enough time to think about, um, is this hard? No, nah, this is just super cool. So it's cool to kind of think like, you know what, the keys, the real keys to success that I'm hearing is like enjoyment, fun, and then like the competing side too. And I think that camaraderie as well, because I guess, you know, we all, we all, we all give up a Saturday, you might say, a whole day on a Saturday and if I walk out there and get run out for a blob and, you know, don't bowl, I've given up a whole day. And people that don't play cricket are like, why the hell would you do that? Like, I'm out there with, like, te- 10 of my best mates, you know? That's why culture is so important because I wouldn't give it up if I was out there in a shit culture. No, I'm out there with some good people. What else am I going to do? Like, all my mates are out there playing. Well, go down and watch? Nah, I can't watch cricket. I want to go and play cricket. Like, it sounds like you're probably a bit similar as well. Like, if someone sucks the cricket on TV, it's yeah. like, nah, nah, I, I want to go and play. That's that's what I want to go and do. But, uh, yeah, I was awful. Like, during the injuries, like, I watched a bit of cricket. But in the end, I just, I just turned it off. Right. Like, I only ever watch cricket if I'm playing because I know that I'm going to – like, I quite like, I'm quite i quite a visual learner, so I'll see something and go, oh, that looks pretty cool. Yeah. And probably go and try it and probably not, not look very cool at all. But <laughs> like, that, that's me. Like, I just, like, watching it, it, it was torture. It yeah. was absolute torture. And I um, I did some BT stuff while they were in New Zealand. Um, and, like, it was a cool experience, but I'm sat there. Like, I'm not sleeping. I've drunk four Red Bulls to stay awake, and I'm like, like, this is stupid. Yeah. Like this is it's cool that I'm doing this, but like this is stupid. Like, and it wasn't a I want to. I feel like I should be there. It was just a like, I can't actually play cricket right now. Right. Like, that was the worst thing, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to play cricket for another three four months. Yeah, crazy. I think now might be a fun time to have a dig into maybe some of the technique stuff because people are always interested in, in like technique stuff. I'm curious though before we do, like, how much are you into like the technical side of things? Would you say you're curious bit, about it? I think, yep. yeah, definitely. And I think my curiosity is that it's, it's gone through the roof because I think everyone starts out and you kind of just bowl, don't you? Mm. And then suddenly you either find something, whether it is an injury or, you know, you have a really interesting conversation with someone or you start bouncing ideas off a senior player, whatever it is. I mm. think there is always a moment that suddenly, if you are going to be interested, like that just gets you. And then once it's got you, I think it's one of those things that you just want to find more and more about. Yeah. I think that's a good way. I mean, I think as I've been like learning more about technique and um, I've, I've got a few nice, I might say biomechanists like felts to like have a few good chats with, but they, I, I find there's a story that goes with the biomechanics. It's like, how do I, what's my movement solution to solve this ideal position? And um, I often like to think about coaching, um, say, say the process, but more your experience of the process because how I've sort of been trying to coach my guys, it's like I, I kind of want to work more on what's your best experience bowling and what's your worst experience bowling. Because often you find when people aren't bowling so well, the the technical roundabout, you know, where, oh, I'm not doing this, and then you focus on that. Oh, but I feel this, and then you focus on that. Oh, but then this, and then you focus on that. And you start to break it down into body parts at certain points in the action, the checklist starts to build. And then it's just really difficult to find, like you said, that freedom, that rhythm. But if you know what's, if you know what your best feels like, wait, I put best over here. If you know what your best feels like <laughs> and your worst feels like, I think what often happens is like you can go, all right, what's missing from my best? You know, am I am I a bit too stiff? Am I overstriding a little bit? You know, do I feel like I'm just a bit heavy? You know, am I trying to muscle it too much? And then you can kind of like give yourself a really proactive way back to your best. 
And then within the coaching technical program, there's a couple of things that you might go, well, this cue worked really well for me. And it felt really good for me. So not only kind of do I have the cue, but I've got some experience of what the cue feels like. And then I like to kind of keep it simple going in. But coming out, once you bowl the ball, you can like reflect and be aware of everything. I think that's a, a useful tool. And I like to say it in regards to not just the technique, but the skill too. Like if you get whacked for six, the the immature player you might say might think, go, oh, fuck, I just bowled shit. Like that's what I'm going to do. And then run in without thinking and then try to bowl a ball and go, I hope I don't get whacked. Now you tell me, where does hope I don't get whacked fit on the wicket? <laughs> send you very far it it does and so i love to make a joke out of it to be like hey you've just achieved what you went in to do you gave yourself no no target you've achieved no target if you bowled a half ball and you got whacked i'd probably bring it back a bit or maybe ball your if you bowled a a good length ball and they've and they've whacked you you know what the bathroom will have to be good too you know yeah Maybe we've got to get, you know, start to get competitive here. And I love that you use that word competitive because it's like you find people lick their lips and be like, all right, if you want to start to take on these balls, I reckon I can bowl the exact same ball a little bit wider from you. You try to do the exact same thing. Maybe now it's top edge and I might get you out. But like yeah. these are the conversations you can't have if you're too busy thinking shit. But look, now, see, 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 this is me now ranting away. I can't seem to help myself. It's been really nice listening to you for the, uh, for the first bit of this chat. Um, I will say though as well, like, I don't have a time period for how long we chat for. Like, I've essentially got time all day. So if you want to chat for seven hours, that's fine. We might burn out. Um, but you know, you, you let me know when, <laughs> when enough is enough. <laughs> all right. I'm going to open up and share my screen now because I want to show off your, uh, Techers. Like these shapes that you get into, like, because I think for people watching, um, these are some terrific shapes to, like, especially a ball release here. You know, everyone wants to know, how do I get like a brace front leg? And that position there, you know, when you've got like a uh, straight front leg, almost like hyper extended, and that's going to be natural to you, obviously. Um, yeah. A bit of like shoulder delay here, perfect. Looks like the, you know, the bowling arms tucked in nicely. Um, the knees are probably quite close together kissing, like just terrific. And I think um, interesting to think back, like, well, okay, well, where might some of these injuries start to, I guess, come from? And this is your newer footage. So, you know, I haven't really got the the older type stuff, but I think one thing I was sort of noticing, I wish I could zoom in, but this will this will work. Um, you know, again, kind of very, very front on, which is probably gonna be really important um, I think for female bowlers, like given that the more side on you kind of get, the more you kind of need the, the muscular power. And there's going to be a difference between what men and women are able to say, muscularly, powerfully produce over a certain period of time. But uh, that is an area that I think they're going to put a lot more research into as well. But um, it probably, I reckon landing here, and I, I know your coaches have spoken about this, like, you know, you might say the double landing at back foot contact. So this means you've kind of got to push off back foot contact. And what I think sometimes happens when you push off back for contact is you get this little um, arch out through your back. So if we come back to the other one, um, and I know this is what you've worked on as well because I had a chat with a few people. <laughs> um, you get this kind of landing here where at the point of back for contact, you've got the legs kind of together. So mm-hmm. the, you're going to need a bit more time on back for contact because like if I said, could you go straight to front for contact now? It'd be like, well, the legs here, like I'm not going to plant it down, you know, a foot in front of me so you get a bit more of a push off and you can probably see like a bit of an arch starts to like you know come out if you can sort of see here that yeah and then that's when you're going to sort of start to you know really pay with your reaction which is really really nice to watch to be honest but i think like i know i spoke to you about your running mechanics before and if i play through the slow-mo like landing on the forefoot almost like gliding through the surface one thing I like to look at is 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 the shoulders too. The shoulders usually tell me how relaxed someone is because if you're quite tensed and stiff, you won't see the shoulders like move up, up and down as much, um, which is sometimes what I'm looking for. And so, but I, I and, and these are just my thoughts and I feel like um, what I like to kind of say before I get into too much like technical stuff is like, I don't have the context of what you've done um, across your journey and it's also not, um, for me to sit here and think about, you know, I've got a chance to, you might say, coach you, and this is going to be like me trying to seize 
opportunity on top of what the others are doing because that would be probably say immoral and unethical i think you know for helping you etc but i reckon one thing i i would say if i wanted to discuss i love this touchdown position you know coming down on the forefoot here you've almost got this knee in front of you now what i wondered was like when you're transitioning in your jump you're not getting the other leg you're not like switching the legs as much if that makes sense so the yes, switching of the that, legs that's means something i've been working on yeah, perfect. Because this is this is where I think like I was having a chat with um someone yesterday about it. When you're um, um I wonder why you've got space here to like move. It's like if you're if you're here, like you know there, it's kind of, it's it's so much easier to say uh ah, uh ah, ah, to back out. But if you're up here because you've just put the leg further up yeah. and legs, I say locked at ninety. It's a little bit easy to keep the pelvis stable. And I know that, like, the boys at Loughborough have yep. put out a bit of stuff around um, lumbo pelvic stability being pretty important, as well as um, some of the risk factors to, uh, uh, you know, those kind of stress fractures, which I'm sure you're all aware about. But that switching kind of thing, where you're essentially removing the leg that's on the ground before the other one comes up. Um, and they do that a bit in running mechanics type stuff with, uh, with sprinters, you know, like sis some, some sort of sis scissoring type drills. And that, that, that would have been where I'd think and go like, all right, well, I've got a bowler here that's, you know, in this position, I wonder what it'd look like if during the jump, um, this, I guess the switching was a little bit more aggressive, which would also mean you probably bring the front leg down equally as aggressive. Now that could increase the ground reaction forces, yeah. which, from what I've been told, uh, the worst things in the world. <laughs> My lovely girlfriend go. has just <laughs> gone for a jog. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if, is, is that is that something that you have kind of worked on with um with with your coaches? I'd love to see the before footage, but you, you you're just not a morning person. Yeah, so I, I can describe what the Perfect. before footage looked like. So, so before you see that my legs probably at yeah. shin height around about and it's probably fluctuated from shin height and when it's been really good it's been quite inconsistent it's got a yeah. little bit higher um but before i'd bowl and it would swing through and down so my leg would go up and down rather than as you've said cycle and down so it's it's a work on progress mm. still but there has been a shift there's the start the cycling pattern is now mm. happening and i think it's been something quite difficult to change because I've been so used mm. to the certain way. And before we had to um, sort of take off like a long jumper yeah. or a triple jumper. So sort of from that where that point that you really like, I've had to work on that too, which was probably the bit I've spent a little bit more time on because we believed if I could get that right yeah. and I wouldn't jump so far into back foot, that would enable me to cycle better then. Because if I'm very long and sort of, sort of going very much that mm. way it'd be very difficult to do that so that was the focus was to get that fr from that sort of step before back up back foot contact to get that a little mm. bit shorter and then work on the cycle so that's something that i'm gonna be very busy with this winter no exciting and, I, and I, it's great that you've started with that with with that touchdown position at say you jump because uh, how, how, how i like to give a story or give it a concept to like the fast bowling stuff is like you've got your run up now if your run mechanics are poor they're gonna they're like a foundational movement so they're obviously going to impact into your um uh you might say bowling organization you know because you can break it down so much but if i just keep it as like how you organize yourself well if during my jump i can land on my forefoot then my legs are going to be close together so i don't have to like spend more time on that foot to then get this leg further forward in the sequence. Like everything's timing. And, and so when you sort that problem, it's like, all right, well now how, how can I get my legs a better switch during the jump? Which means that we're now back from contact. I'm, I'm in a different position. And that different position could be the, you might say the movement solution to what's going to happen later in the sequence versus when you're, when you're kind of like landing it back for contact and then pushing into front foot contact, there could be this, um, movement that occurs where, well, now that you're kind of pushing, well, what am I kind of pushing with? Like I've got my, I'm pushing off my leg. So I might be pushing myself into extension, which then means when I hit front foot contact, 
your abs aren't at the best position to be able to like, say, slam down and crunch forward. So you go, well, now I've probably got to use a different area, you know, and my thoughts are like, when I see people like this is go, you almost need to side flex a little bit because if you if this isn't going to do it, you're going to have to side flex. Otherwise, like, you just won't be able to bowl the ball where you want it. And like, you don't really want to be, like, if you were too forward, you're going to push the ball out all the way over there which isn't going to be how you're going to organize. So we're all going to find ways to self-organize. And it's, it's fun having the conversations of like, you know, how is this unique bowler organizing himself? Where could I pick something out to go, you know, is this going to change this? And I would expect that like, instead of you say landing at back foot contact, it's almost like you're going to skip over back foot contact to get straight into your front foot contact yeah. because you don't need to spend so much time at back foot contact. Um, and you might've heard the term falling into um, front foot contact you can only really do that if you've got like the front leg in a position where it doesn't need more time to um to get set. But there are different bowlers that are, I mean, someone like a Joffre Archer, like his legs are only a little bit forward, but it barely looks like he jumps. He's just he's just like gliding through the crease. It's, it's, it's really quite magical to watch. And I know people think he actually runs in quite slow, but I remember seeing some footage of him running in at like 12, 13, 14 miles per hour. He can get it getting up to like 15 miles. And yeah. that ain't slow. Like, especially, if, you know, you, you're yeah. not really slowing down either. But uh, I think this would be really, and I'm, I'm glad we could kind of like have a chat now at this stage of your career. Because I, I had a chat with, um, with Stella and she's, you know, very early in her career, probably a similar story to you and say she's, she's represented, you know, her country as a teenager. And uh, she also had to go through a bit of rehab with her back. Um, very, very different to yours. And I, you know, touch wood you know she never has to go through something like this but to now be able to have a chance with someone that's you know now going through a bit later in the career you know and still pushing through certain things there's a few more people i'd love to have a chat with and get and get their stories because you find some great great lessons and hopefully it's not just me spatting my mouth off going like i reckon you guys should all do this or people can push back and be like i don't know like i reckon this could also work because like you said everything's individual um but yeah no curious to hear where your technique ends up going after this kind of nice block that you've got ahead, but winter's pretty shit in England, so hopefully there's some nice indoor centres. Well, Loughborough's Loughborough, lovely indoor, so. Yeah, there is. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we're not naive. We know that we're going to spend six months in, in maybe April, we, probably then we get the hand warmers, and sometimes we always get this round and bow of snow. Oh, God. So um, we get the woolly hats on and brave it. But I think, so after Christmas, so in January, which is actually colder than before Christmas, yeah. we, um, we go out onto the Astro, and do field in so that's nice I think there's always a fine line between broken fingers and uh, the benefits but always a bit of team building yeah god i can imagine there's there's nothing i hate more than that as well like i wouldn't call myself soft but maybe i am also a little bit soft <laughs> when, when, when people start and and you get the and this is where you get like the angry coaches that like they'll they'll start to thump balls at you and then people are going to like at the wrong times of the year, I reckon, where now you've got people kind of like worried, so to speak, because they're going to hurt their hands. And someone usually does. And then you kind of walk off going, well, what the fuck was the point in that? Like, you know. Yeah, but I feel like if, you, if, you wor- if you're before a session and you're worried about breaking a finger, you're going to break a finger. Like, you, you're better off going for it. And that, that's, I think that's when you're okay. And I mean, I've touched wood, I've never actually broken a finger with that motto. And I've watched a lot of broken fingers happen. It's, it's- so I'm hoping it's great psychology that, right that there. one injury that I do miss out on. It's, 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 it's like the classic... I just, I just don't do anything half-heartedly. If I'm going to go, I'm going to go. <laughs> I like that. And and you've just touched on the classic, like, if you think you're bowler wide, you're bowler wide. That that kind of psychology. The yeah. mindset you go into it with is pretty much what's likely going to be the outcome. So you may as well go into it believing you can do something. And then I find there's a good conversation to have around, um, you know, your belief in yourself um which also probably comes a lot to your like sense of self-worth in say fast bowling which you you talked a bit about having to become a different bowler and there's something to this especially for fast bowlers i reckon who are potentially like a lot more passionate you might say or a lot more fiery where it's like you know my role in this team is to fire you might say um to not be able to do that and if you've built a persona or you've built a like, but this is me as a person, this is me as a fast bowler, and you can't do that. There's going to be a bit of conflict that I can imagine is a is a, a sacrifice that you make in the short term, but like it it, it it can take away from the enjoyment. So it's been interesting to hear how you've um, 
be managing this and then be really aware of what you need to kind of bring back, which I think is terrific. That awareness is just... Yeah, I think it's been a mixed bag. Yeah. Like, I know that as a kid, sort of so some of the younger players that have come through that now I know quite well, um, a couple of them thought they thought I was quite scary when I was a bit younger and that that's that's music to my ears because that's on the pitch. Yeah, so you okay. know that, that's me doing my job right because you know, off the pitch I'm I'm pretty friendly. I feel like I'm quite a smart yeah, chap. Yeah. Like so I think on the pitch that's that's how I want that's how I want to be perceived and that that, that doesn't that but doesn't bother me yeah. in the slightest that people think I'm a bit of a knob. Like I couldn't care because that's on the pitch. Um and I think you have to you have to get yourself mm. I think into a sort of a, a little bit of a extroverted sort of slightly different self of you where you're just using all your best bits that you do have to get into the battle. And that that's how I do it. And I think, as you've said and touched on, not being able to, I mean, you can't do that when you're just trotting in doing 60 percenters, like it's soul destroying. Yeah. Um, so I think destroying. it was a really, and I probably, if I was um, slightly better at, sort of not wanting to tear in um it would have happened a lot sooner but I really did struggle with the fact that I couldn't just let go of it like, I really did struggle I resonate with, with that um, so well like, oh, if I can't, <laughs> like if I can't if I can't do it then what's the point yeah. and I'm very much if I can't and actually but that's actually what I've had to do for two seasons is to sort of do, do a little bit and yeah it, it's been very challenging and it was actually I mean, it was. Uh, it's very. I should have done mm. it sooner. But um, so in the hundred, like I said, I was sort of jogging in and bowling majority of slower balls. And I mean, someone missing a slower ball because you'd see them is cool, but it's not as fun as being someone yeah. who's like hands down. Mm. Or you get a little bit of swing, and even inside edge squirts out to square leg that excites mm. me because I'm in the game. But I, it just doesn't do it for me. Um, so anyway, I got through that, and then there was a couple of regional games left and we played the Yorkshire Diamonds second to last game, I think it was. And before the game, um, Lauren Winfield Hill has been in the absolute form of her life right. this summer. Like she's just, she's been hitting runs for fun and she opens the batting for them. And I was like, at whatever stage I bowl here, because I thought I was going to be first change mm. because I've been a bit protected. I hate that right. word protected. So in the hundred, I got told I was going to be sort of protected a little bit. So I'm not going to get the new ball. I'm going to bowl and ease it sort of, safe areas of 100 ball games just never been like that doesn't happen um and I ended up bowling like the last set of five which was fantastic I felt it was actually the best I felt oh. the entire 100 was when I was bowling those last Amazing. five I got hit for a six that's fine but every other ball I nailed like first ball hit for six I was like shit <laughs> and then next four bang on job done go home brilliant and that, but that's the best I felt all summer and after that was kind of something I took with me that even if I'm a little bit rusty, because I can tell you now, I've not practiced one session right. Yorkers, and I decided to bowl Yorkers and sort of beat slow ball when they thought it was going to be a Yorker double bluff. That's what I decided to do, and like, I just went for it. Like I've committed, Amazing. and it came out okay. But I'd done absolutely nothing this summer because I wasn't allowed to. I was just concentrating on this mm. technique and sort of looking at what my best ball looks like hitting top of off. Mm. And that that was me. And then. This Yorkshire Diamonds game, I was like, I was like, no, if I bowl some gentle wind swingers, sixty percent, seventy percent, I'm gonna go and get yeah. it myself because she's just yeah. gonna hit me. And Holly Arms, who's just at like, the other end, like she, she's batted very well this year, and I think it's been a bit of a breakout year for her. And I was like, if I do this, like it's just not gonna go well. And like the first couple of overs, I'm like easing in, easing in. I'm like, nah, like, I've got to do what I'm told, kind of thing. And then I kind of just, I got, I bowled ball and it's like a little gentle like it's swung in looked quite nice and Lauren's literally just gone bosh over mid on one bounce four mm. and I've turned around and gone I can't do that again <laughs> like, I'm not doing it like, that's that's just not happening yeah. and then I maybe two overs later I've bowled her a bouncer and it's pretty mean like it's gonna hit her in the head if she doesn't get out of the way of it and it's gone through to nap the keeper and you can hear it and I'm like right I'm in yeah. like that's me and I think you can still find a way and I wish that I sort of worked it out that I'm in the game mm. and it's trying to find your way to get in the game. Yeah. And even if I wasn't bowling at 74 miles an hour, I can still bowl bounce through at 68. Yeah. But if I, if I bang it in and I mean it, you look at Sam Curry and he's not the quickest, but his bounce is probably one of the hardest to mm. face because it gets you. And I'm not the tallest. So I do back my bounce because it's pretty scary. Yeah. 
and you can still, but that, that just one ball was like a light switch. And that's made me come in. I think it's what I needed to come into this winter because it's sort of the summer I knew that I'd have to do some more technical stuff over the winter. And it felt quite mm. daunting because it was, it was going to be another however many weeks of not just being able to run in. And obviously every winter you get that sort of build up period. You don't bowl for a bit of time, then you build back up, et cetera, et cetera. But I was just like, I don't, I don't know if I can do it. I just, I just yeah. let go. I want to take the handbrake off. And I think that little four over spell was exactly what I needed because it gave me hope. Right. I think, I think it genuinely gave me hope that I was that bolder in me that I'd sort of missed out right. on was still there. And that's given me that energy and sort of that passion again. to go, right. If I do this bit, right, I get, I get my front leg cycling better. I know that I'm going to be able to get back whether it takes you. You, want to, mm. you need to play games, I believe, to get pace, I think. And you need to bowl balls with intent. Like, you can't... If you bowl balls and you're sort of coasting <laughs> through, you ain't going to get quicker yeah. and you ain't going to bowl quick. But, like, if you bowl balls with a purpose, that's how you get your pace mm -hmm. and that's how you can bowl consistently quick yeah. when you start playing two games a week. But I know that's going to take a little bit of time because I haven't bowled much in the last two years, three years, so it will take a bit of time, but I know that if I've got that mindset, I'm doing everything possible to be the bowler yeah. I want to be. And I think that's, that's a important. great lesson for life. Like I'm doing everything I can be to become the person I want to be, you know, and you can just sit back and be like, I'm just doing the best I can. And you know what? We're going to take, I'll be the person I want yeah. to be. That's a whole new challenge, but you know what? Right now. Yeah. I and I, 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 I found that so interesting because I remember when I had a bit of free time, when I was staying in Utrecht in the in the Netherlands, and I was about a k and a half away from like an outdoor but like roofed um, cricket centre at a camp on, and so I went down there and kind of met the people there. It, it was during winter, so I I coached with their fast bowlers, but it was a three lane facility where I could like push the nets back. I had it all to myself. And I thought, you know what? It'd be really fun to just mic myself up. And kind of go through a bit of fast bowling and stuff. I haven't bowled in ages because I, I was coming back from a, I don't know, a violent series of like certain things, but tr bouncing back and forth around the world hasn't been good for my consistency, you might say. Um, but I found myself when I had, I had certain things I was working on. <laughs> but I'd, I'd get kind of one right and be like, oh God, that felt good. I just want, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, Fang it this time. I'm really going to try and like fire it and go a little bit quicker. And I'd fuck it up completely. And I'd sit back and be like, it's amazing how when you're in the moment, just how much that desire to go above what you're doing or like that desire to like fire, I think is the best way to put it. Um, it just takes over you. Now, I, I didn't have anybody, you know, with expectations on me. So I, I'm really finding it quite amazing how well you've been able to, you know, almost do what's been recommended you know and 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 hold yourself back a little bit which sounds like a um a lesson in and of itself i'm not sure where you're going to apply that but then also to be like nah you know what Ta tactically wise this is what i've got to do and it's also giving you that reminder of you know who you are which sounds like it just just a couple of balls and i would be saying like write down exactly how that felt because like that feeling but i want you to remember like for the whole phase going back through and then to when you finally do get back out there and bowl again fascinating hopefully mm. actually one thing i did want to ask the technique was has there, has there been a change in like how quickly you're trying to run in, in into the crease too yeah massively so i used to run in i don't know miles per hour but um 22 23 okay. clicks um, which was significantly Seriously quicker good. than the rest of the bowlers. That's um, right. So I personally think it's a good thing if you want to bowl quick. <laughs> um, but I understood that at the moment, yeah. um, sort of safety-wise at the time, it was, you know, I need to get back on the park and probably a little bit too mm. quick. And if I tail back a little bit, get these things right, then I can build on that. And I don't know if that's going to be the case, but in my head, that's the case. Yeah. Um, so I think it's trying to find a, a happy medium but at the moment so I've done a lot of running mechanics a lot of work on that and I run well I sprint well um, and the S&C coach 
Dave, like if he tells you you, you sprint well, like you must sprint well because like a compliment from him right, is very okay. hard to get. Um, so you're like, you're like, calm, that, that's done. So then it's transferring that into your bowling. But I think you also need that fluidity, that rhythm in your run-up. And I think you can't be too... I think it should look a little bit different to how you sprint. Yeah. That's my personal opinion. Because if you get too technical, too upright, I don't. I think you need a little bit of a yeah. lean, a little bit of a sort of glide. So I think if you start getting a little bit, it's not quite mm. right. And I think at sort of 60, 70%, that was, I was a little bit too far that way. And I think if I just bring myself into a little bit more of a natural mm. run, because I naturally run well, I don't run like an idiot. Like I can find a happy medium. Yeah. Um, and then that will actually enable me to get into a good position to sort of pop through front foot off I go. Um, so I think like there's a I want to run in know that that's something mm. I can add. It's it's interesting because that's that's the yeah point. that's great and it's it's funny because if if you look at what the research is like correlated with. Everyone just reckons, you know, just running faster. But often when you look at the shapes you get into when you're running too fast, there's a real drop-off point, and that's been well-researched. And it's hard as well because if you ask people, like, yeah. how do you feel when you feel best? And they're like, I'm just flying it. It's difficult to then say, but, you know, you actually bowl quicker when you kind of slow it down a bit because your actual bowling sequence, yeah. it just holds up a lot better. That's always been hard for me to, uh, to kind of let go of, but... For someone yeah. that runs in a twenty-two clicks, like, and I think what's key is um this how how so you run in, but then if you slow mm, down during true. your delivery sequence, so that happens quite a lot with bowlers and how. So I actually pretty much kept, so I hardly dropped off, which is probably slightly wrong, just because like, everything was happening so fast and I was jumping so far, like my jump to right. back foot was ridiculous, yeah. which made everything yeah. quite long. So I think it will actually, I think that would be the last piece of the jigsaw in terms of once I get the more important things right in terms of sort of my, my front foot cycle. I think that's the key thing for me. I want to get a little bit more side on and that would just help align my front foot. Those two things together, I think I'd be sound. And then sort of after that, that's actually when I can have that license to sort of find out what enables yeah. me to fall quick. And that's the exciting part, but I've just got to do this bit first and keep reminding myself of what can Yeah, happen. and I did see the front foot kind of slightly turned out a little bit, but I'm guessing that's probably just a simple, yeah. like, how I like to explain it is, like, you're always going to be rotating. Yeah, um, as long, I don't mind. So if, my, if my foot, so say it's here at the yeah. moment, if it just comes in a little bit, if it's a little bit splayed, I don't actually mind because I look at Mark Wood and he's bowling this morning, bowling absolute rockets. His foot's a little bit turned yeah. out. I think it's more think important Jimmy where it is in terms of the crease. Yeah. Yeah, and he, obviously he's pretty He's not too, too bad, yeah. <laughs> not, too, not shabby. too shabby at all. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm not too not too mad about the splay. I think my ankle's going to be a bit unforgiving, but hey-ho. But, yeah, I want to just get it to shuffle over a yeah. little bit and then sort of after that, just, just bowl. Just bowl. I like that. But it is kind of tricky as well, like yeah. especially where, like, if I mean, I mean, I mean, you talked about running out of the, like, running into the crease and running out of the crease. And I remember having a chat with Matt Mason. He was saying that Jai Richardson almost comes out of the crease faster, so he potentially might have something similar in his action. Where, like, and I think I've seen some footage of him from yeah. behind where it does kind of look like he's he's off back foot contact real quick. I'm not sure where his front leg is. I know he gets into a great position, yeah. but that might be something I'll have to have a look at actually to uh to you know to compare yeah. but uh it'll be exciting for you to get back to you know or like see how the journey goes and i'd be curious to like have another chat in a year or whenever it is when you you know you kind of get yourself back out there and hear how how things have sort of progressed uh i did want to kind of touch back to a couple other things um more like around like what things you do for your like you might say mental well-being or the sorts of like things that you've learned about yourself um coming through all this because like it's almost been a decade like what sorts of things you've kind of like learned about to be like what do i need to do to take care of myself as a professional athlete given the the context of what it means to be a pro athlete paid to do what you love expectations pressure yeah i'm actually probably going to say something slightly different to sort of what you perhaps expect is that you get told so I think a hobby, whatever it is, is really mm. important and is sort of non-negotiable. But you also get told, you get sort of like your personal development, welfare people and, you know, sort of lots of people that want to help. 
And actually, when you try and do things almost for the sake of it, because you think you should be doing something, right. uh, that's actually can have the adverse mm. effects of what, of what you want. And I start, so I started doing these courses and I, they were all very interesting, mm. but I was doing it because I felt like I had to do right. it. And I actually, I just, very unlike me, I kind of just tailed off because I wasn't doing it for me yeah. and I wasn't, I was sort of doing it because I got sort of got told I probably should be doing it. And then actually, I don't know how many months passed and I just suddenly, like, I think I'd probably watched something rogue on Insta and sort of found something that was really passionate. And then I was like, oh, like, I remember doing something on the course. And like, that's what got me back mm-hmm. into it. And then because I found something, that's what got me back into it and actually made it a success. Yes. So I think it's very important that you do things that you actually mm-hmm. enjoy and you actually want to do. And f- for different people, they may want to watch, you know, Grey's Anatomy straight through and like, or the Harry Potter's, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that that could be what they need. And I think at different points as a professional athlete, you're going to need different things. Mm-hmm. And I think if you do have that awareness, I think it's very different if you probably lack a little bit of awareness of what you need and you do need a little bit of guidance and a little bit of pushing. But I think for me, because I have the one good thing out of all these sort of rehabs and experiences I've had is I'm pretty self-aware in what I need. And that's how I sort of worked out that I didn't need to do things if I didn't want to do them. And that sometimes less is more. And I think less is more is I don't need to do four gym sessions a week. I can actually just do two or three if I'm in mm. season and that's absolutely okay because that's what I need. Yeah. And you don't always have to do too much and you can sort of burn yourself out and that's probably how I felt a little bit is that although I wasn't perhaps doing as much because I wasn't allowed to bowl, I, t- I felt tired right. and it was because I was trying to do all these things to keep me in a good state but actually it was, it actually wasn't actually helping me. Really and then good. I found a really nice sort of it, it felt it actually, and I had a nice balance of, you know, what today I've woken up, I've gone to the gym. I don't want to go to the gym, mm. but I've gone. But I've got what I need out of that session. But like, I was going to go and do this. You know what? I'm okay. And like that day, I know what I need. I'm just, I'm just going to recharge yeah. and then I can reorganize it. I can, and then the next day, and then suddenly I, I'm there half an hour early to train because like, I'm ready. Like I've, I've recharged yeah. and I think that's really important is that you can't I think some we have all these chats about how to keep mm. your mental health in a good place that you can get caught up on doing things that work for other yeah. people and it's all good try them absolutely try them but actually sit back and go does mm. it work for me that's the most important question Huge. and then that's actually where you'll get the benefits because if you're just going through, you end up doing what you're already doing, which sounds really mm-hmm. crazy, is that maybe you were struggling and you were doing it, but you end up still struggling because you're not actually helping yeah, yourself. That's so true. And and there is this, me personally, I think there's a big issue with the whole self-care wellness type thing where it's quite a profitable business. So I often find like people make problems to then solve with like their solutions you might say but i love that you touched on like it, it, it needs to have some sort of value to yourself if you've set yourself you know you know the classic uh routine where it's like wake up at like you know 5 a.m drink a glass of water do 20 push-ups have a cold shower write down my five um gratitudes or something like that and it's just like really really structured type thing where like i'm 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 not a morning person yeah when i wake up with I'm not right. a structured person or a morning a person. Coffee, that's self-care for me. Like, I feel fucking amazing when I, you know, keep, yeah. when I give myself time. And often that's also when I write my posts. It's like I wake up, it's probably about 10, 11. So in Australia, it's a decent time to try to post around the subcontinent, also a good time. And, and for the UK too, it's like that, that, that works really, really well for me. And I love how you said like, trying different things and i had this idea for myself and i was reflecting back on my 20s and i was like i don't think i gave myself enough of a chance to try enough things because i was too busy thinking about um who am i and i had this thought going like i reckon a better question is who am i not because who am i not is wonderful it opens mm-hmm. the whole world up to everything you know i can be like well who am i who am i not let's let's try this nope not that let's try this nope not that let's try this eh, i might explore this 
And like, if I think back to what the guitar gave me, especially during COVID, I'd fall asleep with it and then I'd wake up next to it. I had, had you know, my girlfriend was in Europe and we, and we were apart for, I think, 11 months or something like that. So my guitar became my, you know, my new girlfriend. And I called her Betty. And my girlfriend got a little bit jealous, but, you know, only a little <laughs> bit. Um, but, you know, what I got out of it was like, I really, really enjoyed doing this. You know, it was almost like a second passion. And we know that across our life, like cricket's not just going to be the only thing. And I think I find that like, if it is the only thing, that's when it's quite challenging because you've got nothing else to go to. Like, and maybe that's a better question. Where do you go when you haven't got cricket? I'm guessing not to the pub where your parents are, you know, every day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like they, they've actually retired out of oh, the right, pub yeah. business. They have real <laughs> real jobs now. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what I tell yeah, them anyway. <laughs> um, so I think it varies. I think it depends where you're at. So what I did during rehab probably looks very different to yeah. when I'm playing. And again, that's doing things that work for me. So during rehab, I'd go for mm. walks. Um, like, but then the summer, like, I've hardly gone for a walk. Um, so during rehab, and that's not because I'm neglecting, but I just different things yeah. work for me. So during rehab, I go for these long walks, and the Peak District isn't far from me, and I just go off and I have a vague sort of idea of where I'm going. But it's not until so I've I, I put it on the old watch, and then you go back onto your app and you go, Jesus, I've yeah. just I've just wandered, and that's when you sort of have that reflection nice. and. You get away, you get the fresh air. And for me, that yeah. really works. And sometimes I'd go with a mate, sometimes I wouldn't. Like my nan and I are very close and we love going for walks. So in the summer, I'd go for walks with her, but I wanted to spend time with her. So that was more of a, we'd go for Wonderful. coffee kind of thing. So I think that's sort of the biggest difference is when I am sort of in season, if you like, I search, I, I recharge by yeah. being with other people. Whereas sort of, away from that I like to have my space but I think I think it's probably because in season I knew mm. there was a lot of pressure I wasn't very happy with where I was at as a cricketer so having those people that you sort of the people you mm. love the people that you love spending time with that's really important to surround yourself with those whereas in the winter I sort of had this really common goal and it'll be it'll be similar this winter I know where I want to get to I know what I want to do during winter training and you still have those people mm. around you, but you also, I think I'm going to have that time to reflect. And I think it's just different stages of the year of sort of what you're trying to get out of life or whether you're a cricketer or a basketball, like whatever it is, I think it's what you're trying to get out in that moment, knowing what you need and what helps you keep mm. in a really good place. And it doesn't matter if it changes because you just need to do what, what you feel and whether that is going to the pub you crack on if it's a gin and tonic I'm there <laughs> but like sometimes it's not and sometimes you just want to go to bed and yeah. watch Netflix and there's really sort of two ways to go about it and absolutely fine and each moment's gonna require something different and I think that awareness to like be like well what do I need in this moment based on my past experience to be like I think this will work for me um it's terrific and, and I think that's a really good lesson that like I'd, I'd love to try to be sharing with like a lot of people because often I find like what we do outside of cricket is going to have a huge impact on what happens in, inside cricket. And, and I'm sure you're like, you're, you're aware you're only probably training for maybe 10 hours of the week, you know, maybe, maybe a bit more. So what do you do with the other? A little bit longer. They yeah, work as hard enough. I think also when you add the games in there as well, um, but you know, okay, so twenty hours a week. You still got the other hundred and twenty odd. You go, okay. Well, what sorts? What, what am I going to do outside yeah. of here um, with that? And so, I think it's good to have the conversation to be like, well, what do pro players or what do really, really anyone do with their spare time to make sure when they come into cricket, they're able to get the most out of it? And I think it's interesting for men, probably a lot more different because you know. We don't have a you know a menstrual cycle where we're always coming in at different hormonal states where we just need to make sure that when we get there, yeah. you know, we're in a state where we can go into the training method and get the most out of it. I think that's another area that I thought for women would be a cool thing to discuss too if you're happy to it, just because I think it's I find that really challenging. Yeah. I th and it's also something that like I've I've coached a lot of female clients, so I've I've tried to inform myself as best I can. My approach has always been like I want to empower you to say, make the necessary choices. But I also aware that like in my philosophy, when I put an individual into a coaching program, 
the state that that individual is in is going to dictate how well my coaching program is going to be. So I also want to make sure I'm not putting pressure yeah. on that individual where they've got to say, train at a certain level. It's like I want the training program to fit the individual, not the individual to fit the training program because then I'm just going to create poor culture and probably not know what's going on in their life, you know. And that's probably going to be quite a challenging thing too when you're walking out having yeah. to perform. I think it's still quite untapped mm. in terms of as professional athletes. I think, you know, the fact that, you know, in football, for example, they're only just changing sort of white shorts to a different right. colour. I think it does show that it is something that's a yeah. little bit behind. But I think in cricket, there's been, there's been, a, I know there's been a dedicated um, sort of like few members that are like constantly yeah. talking about it and trying to work out how mm. it can get better. And I think that's really important that you do have, you know, just that focus and for example so in cricket and this is at England mm. regional level um sort of all the way through is that there's a monitoring app and it's an absolute pain in my ass because I always forget to do it but it's got a very right. good purpose and you put your loads in it um so your bowling loads what you did have you done a run kind mm. of thing and you just pop those in but they also have a separate bit and that's yeah. are you on your period are you like have you got any symptoms mm. what are they how are you feeling is it affecting your motivation? Like there's these sort of questions on it and you just, it's, it's, I think it's one to 10 and you just pop yourself yeah. where you are on it and you can skip it if you want. Like, so if you feel uncomfortable, yeah. you don't have to answer it. Um, and I think that's really important because I know I, obviously regions will do slightly mm. different things and every team will, but you can affect. So then you start to get, actually it makes you think, ah, oh, like, can I push through this day? Or actually, you know what? Today I'm I'm not going to, but I know that tomorrow or the next day I'm going to be in a yeah. much better position to go and try and get a PB because some days you, you you're just going to have yeah. nothing, and like that's really okay. And that's maybe the day that you play football manager. That's what I think anyway. <laughs> um, but you just I think it's important, and I think we feel you know we're so critical mm. on ourselves, and we feel like we have to, but actually mm. it's okay. Like. It's our bodies. Yeah. We should love them, and that's absolutely fine. We should embrace it. And yeah, I just I think there's so much that you can do, and that mm. potentially could be done. But I think more importantly is that we are having these conversations, and that is the sign. I think I think it will follow a similar thing to how mental yeah. health's gone. Is that it will get talked about and championed, yeah. if you like, and it will actually be this very open topic that you know. Because I think sort of someone goes, oh. I remember at school, like the teacher wouldn't let one of the class, you know, my classmates go to the toilet and she needed mm. to change a tampon. But the teacher said no. And she's like, like so like, I really need to go right. to the toilet. Like, and, you know, mm. that I, and you, you straight away, you're like, you think, oh, like she needs to go to the toilet. And she, he said no. And I really, I don't think he was doing it, you know, because of anything. He just, right. he wasn't aware. He was simply wasn't aware. And in the end, she's literally, I mean, favorite moment of year nine she's literally walked in front of the entire class with her tampon going so i need to go to the toilet and obviously he's gone half like mortified like, yeah yeah of course but like that's what you know Brilliant. and obviously not everyone's gonna do that you know you're gonna be as I, I don't know if i'd walk through the class at that time with the tampon yeah. maybe nowadays yeah. it's a little bit different and um, but i think you know that growth and that shows how far you've come because mm. now if a female probably went, I mean, I'm not in school anymore, so I don't know, but I can only assume, and I think it is the way that I've done coaching and I've seen other coaches, if sort of a female says, I need to go yeah. to the toilet, it's straight away, yes. And I think that's such a small thing. And perhaps people may think, well, that what's, what's the point? Why is that a big deal? But it's how it feels that you, it doesn't, it shouldn't be a stressor. No. You shouldn't have to go to school or go to training and feel uncomfortable or worry about it. And I think the more that changes, just yeah. in life and obviously in professional sport because, you know, you're on TV. And I remember right, playing a men's game at sort of 15, 16, and I'm pretending to, like, loosen me back off on the floor just to make sure mm -hmm. I'm all good. Like, it's – you you literally you, – you're going through a journey, and I think like, I didn't have a separate toilet right. to change in. I was sort of out in the – there was, like – I think they stored the lawnmower in it. Like I used to go there yeah. to change. Like I think it's all these things that are just helping girls feel yeah. more welcome. And you know that's 
that's about periods, but that's also just about mm. participation. And I think the yeah. two go hand in hand. I'd say so. I mean, the, the more you can understand the challenges that a woman's going to face versus, say, the challenges that the only ones that you're aware of, also it kind of links back to, like, the coaches that have only had their own playing experience. Well, you've only had your own experiences, so how are you supposed to put yourself into somebody else's life? And it's also why I love the yeah. idea of cultures where it's like, it is really open, so you can have these kind of conversations, get to know the individual, yeah. how do I get the best out of you, empower them to yeah. do that. They then feel supported, which is... And like a small example, like went to Yorkshire, Headingley, and they've put, there's like bins in the toilets, mm. there's tampons on the sides. Like just that, like such a small little thing that's taken maybe 10 minutes, yeah. maybe 20 if you've gone to the shop and bought some. But like that little small moment, like you walk in and you're like, oh, like that's yeah. really good. And like the fact that you have to walk into a toilet sometimes, like at stadiums and have to pay for one or they're not even there. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, I think... And then you have to sort of walk around and you sort of nudge and you've got mm-hmm. tampon. Like it's, I think the younger is going to have moments as a female where you get caught out. But I think the more that it's just common practice and, that, you know, the, the simple thing like there's a bin in yep. the toilet, like it's, it's massive. It's all this really funny comedy skit. And I think, it, I can't remember who the comedian was, but it's talking about what if it was the other way around? What if men had periods? everybody would be talking about it. Like, it'd be everywhere. Be you know, oh, gosh, I've got a heavy one today, et cetera, et cetera. He had some really, really funny jokes. And uh, <laughs> it's interesting that, you know, it, it is something that kind of needs to be hidden away. And I've always wondered, like, you know, if, if something needs to be hidden away, then, then, then you're going to create something around it. It's why, like, mental health is so important as well. And I think having a safe space for, for individuality. And uh, I know also, like, I went to an all-boys private Catholic school you know, had to wear the blazer, the, the 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 hair had to be the opposite of what it is right now, which could be why I've had it there. But I remember having to fit into a model and just suffering. Now, I personally don't think that boys should go to an all boys school. Mm. I think that's ridiculous, mainly because, like, well, you can't do all your growing, learning, debating, arguing in a classroom without women. That just that doesn't make sense to me because then you become nineteen yeah. year olds or whatever, and you and you go off. But I just remember, like, I had I had no ability to express my individ- individuality. But at that moment in my life, I didn't even know what it was. I didn't have a chance to kind of, like, figure it out. Mm-hmm. And if anything, because it got shunned, it, it took me a little bit, you know, to say, you might say, mature a little bit later, in, in fairness. Like, I think you're always growing. There's no such thing as a growing up. That's just my philosophy, you know. But uh, it's, it's interesting that because I would want to, I think sport in general is a wonderful place where people are going to grow up. You know, it sounds like you've had a coach who's been there to support you a long way through your journey. And I'm imagining you've become a, a different person along different phases with, with my, I need to, I need to buy new earplugs because these things bloody fall out all the time. But <laughs> and then I'm really good at getting lost at what I, I said that before, getting lost at what I was saying. But um, the individuality thing, you know, like allowing people like, like sport, and, and the clubs you get involved in and the people that you're around, they form a huge part in, in, in helping raise you. And the more aware people are of like people's individual journeys or, you know, the journeys between men and women and I guess anybody else's individual choices, it's probably great, I think, to have a bit more of a conversation around. And I appreciate you having a chat about that because that almost feels weird. That, like, it's- Yeah, I think the more it happens, just like how rare it is right. that this happens and I think – the more that it does, like you said, it's like normally like to be asked about it is quite well, rare as well. And, what I thought. You know, quite a lot of people are absolutely okay mm. to sort of answer because we want to we want to yeah. make it normal. Like it should be normal. It should be no different to you asking about right. the bowling technique. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It should, and it's just, it's just, but then it's like this big elephant in the room that you, you, just, don't, you just don't talk about because it's, you know, hush, hush. It's, 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 it's another interesting thing. And I, I don't think I'll ever really talk about it on a podcast like this, but more like politics and sport too, you know? It's, it's not a conversation I think I can have with a player that's currently playing, mainly because like it sounds like you've had a great experience so far. I'm sure you've had experiences where it's like politics and sport has has not been good or you've probably heard different experiences of politics and sport has not been good or I think just like improper coaching where what someone's done is just not okay you know or like what someone's done is not just okay by like social or societal like ethical standards um, that's not a good thing and there's been plenty of conversation around um, those kinds of things in cricket but more just around like you don't understand the impact you're having on this person and and you may have just like you know 
ruined their their whole enjoyment of cricket or their whole reason for you know getting here. And I I really do find that quite upsetting. I think given like cricket is a place and those teams are a place where like yeah. you that they, they're going to help you grow up. Hmm. Mm. I think we've seen a shift in terms of just in cricket in terms of for example the amount of people that come from private school or sort of standard school and that's from the things like chance to shine and all those initiatives is that it's making cricket accessible because you know cricket can be a very expensive sport you know, it's not like football where you kind of just rock up with an old tattered yeah. ball and you can play for hours like cricket you do need some sort of yeah. facilities and obviously if it rains I mean, I've played cricket in the rain many times, but it, it doesn't really no. work. It doesn't. It doesn't Look at the, not the T20 same. Cup and in I Australia. Think, you know. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute shambles. Well, it's, it's some weather front, isn't it? I can't Lenina, remember what it's called. I think. I was reading about it the other day. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. So, I mean, everyone's slating for them holding the um, World Cup in October. November but um I mean the big bash gets played yeah. there every year normally it's absolutely fine you can't slate it just because you know the world's and climate change and all that's creating some yeah. freak weather thing that's causing it to rain absolute cats and dogs pretty day. much I did see a comment but it's just there's just there's so many yeah, things so true and I did see a comment that was like you know why didn't why don't we play indoors and I saw someone reply and it was like you're right why didn't they figure out five months in advance that there was going to be a, a, a very unique weather event the wettest summer the wettest start to the summer ever and I'm having a laugh back in uh, Australia with like my mates in Melbourne and uh, they've had five weeks they haven't yet played round one and like I'm over here in Germany like it's pretty it's been pretty decent weather you know and so i think to myself like oh, i'm so happy i did not go back to play the start i spent a bit more time here. yeah i just think it's absurd if you guys can come over here and play cricket if you want like it might be getting a bit colder but it's not too bad at the moment to be honest even now it's it's holding sort of like 14 yeah 15 that's degrees. like summer in like, england sometimes start of november like this week England, it's yeah. shorts weather I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got shorts on, like, this is yeah, tropical. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think back to my time in England, kind of strangely, my first experience was coming into London in January, started January, it was fucking miserable. It was yeah. just, it was so miserable. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure what kind of a person you are and what vibe, you know, fits you, but like, I'm much more like my open spaces, a bit more nature, like, you know, find me. Lost on yeah. a hike somewhere. Oh, you'd hate London <sighs> then. You'd absolutely hate Concrete London. jungle. And it's like this, it's so it's so <laughs> busy. And what I found as well was like the, the homeless people and the super rich people are just as rude. <laughs> it was really interesting. You, you, you'd be like having yeah, a... There's, right. there's nothing. It was just, it, I found it to be a... And then the parks as well. Like you go to Hyde Park, I'm like, this this is like manicured you might say it doesn't it doesn't feel like i'm i'm at a, a a natural it's it's fake it's been put there but january you know and and having an experience of like what miserable weather really is coming from melbourne where the joke is like you get four seasons in one day it's been like i've had 12 straight days here and i haven't seen the sun I think it's been interesting to to experience that and be like, I wonder, like, like say, say for my girlfriend, she she really does feel the weather fluctuations in in her mood, and so I like to say, but you know, we can't be giving too much power away because otherwise we can't control that. Then I'm finding myself going like, fuck, I need some sun, like, Jesus Christ. And then I started thinking about the people who live up north. <laughs> Maybe that's why they say the English. Is <laughs> well, <laughs> now it all starts to make sense for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. but it's interesting like say thinking about how those weather situations yeah. are going to affect your mood as well and like how you start to manage with it but i'm not sure what you are like i'm, I'm curious like what, what what kind of spaces and vibes do you prefer to find yourself in um i i didn't i'm not really a london girl and um, there's a really nice thai place that i like to go okay. to in london and that's about it there's a couple of cool cricket grounds um yeah. but yeah no i'm so I train in Birmingham, but I chose to live um, 40 minutes just outside yeah. because I've got got like a postcode and there's stuff around that. But then 20 minutes, sort of maybe I reckon I could walk 20 minutes and there's, there's fields. Nice. And like they're the nice fields that you kind of walk. There's, there's obviously a lot the stuff closer. Mm. And then if I pop in the car, it's 45 minutes to the Peak District. Um, 
so yeah that's that's kind of my vibe I quite like sort of to be chilled and then yeah I pick and choose I can if I'm up for it I'm, I'm good value on a night yeah. out but if I'm not I'm, 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 I'm either there or like I'm, I'm just not I'm, I'm here but like there's no I get you. I, 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 I resonate with that. Probably also like, you know, how my nights out usually finish with me, like, you know, stumbling home, going like it's either all or nothing, which is why my learning is like finding that nice in-between <laughs> balance. But I really enjoyed how before you said we'd... Are you still oh, searching for that? The, the journey goes forever. I spent a bit of time uh, walking the Camino. So I went to Spain with a, a friend of mine and, and he spoke with Spanish, which was so important because like they, they weren't very nice as a whole, which I call it, it's quite strange, but, you know, we called it. Yeah, I've just been to a bit around yeah. Spain and I was a little bit yeah. surprised. I was in Madrid and Valencia and they, uh, yeah, I think feel very I, welcome. I really? Like, like, I can, I don't know much Spanish, but we could sort of, like, mm. pass. So at least, you know, they could see okay. we were trying, you know. I think people appreciate when you try, but... Uh, Maybe not. Maybe that's where you go wrong in Spain. Is that they'd rather if you didn't speak just just to accept that yeah. today. But I think Spain in general is quite unfriendly. I I preferred France. I quite like France. Yeah. They're quite friendly. I found that hit and, miss. and Portugal. I went to Lisbon and that that was yeah. Oh, it depends where you go in France, isn't it? It's quite a big country. It's true, actually. And well, where I was as well didn't really feel like. France because it was like on the coast but it was like the touristy area so you know it was all the people who had come from Germany and Freiburg whereabouts were you? Uh, Le Gorp uh, on like the south the the south end of the coast on the west coast north south east west yeah that okay. coast um, kind of yeah the west I was going to say this <laughs> I, I, try, I try to think like make sure I get my north and west and south and stuff right never eat soggy wheat because that's how you yeah, remember yeah. it um, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah and that's how it was easy easy to kind of get down to spain and and, and go for a walk but we sat there walking the camino yeah. but we called it our camino del vino which is like you know the wine walk etc because you know there's such wonderful wine there you must have a bottle or two of yeah wine is a bonus oh, it was terrific it was really really enjoyable but uh get me a glass of red that was a challenge though because like we 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 buy a bottle was it? Well, there was just so much cheap wine that we'd sit there and probably have like, I don't know how many glasses I should be saying I was having, but like we'd have a bottle after we finished walking about 25 Ks. Then we'd probably yeah. have about eight or nine glasses with, with, with like dinner and then, you know, chat, etc. after. And then we'd go and walk 25 Ks the next day. And then we'd, you know, sort of start that, that kind of cycle again. It was, it was, it was just amazing. Yeah. Um, and anyone that is, Good way to live. Definitely. Oh, well, look, I, <laughs> we only did it for four days. Or, yeah, four days. So I think anything more than that. And, uh, and back, <laughs> back to reality. reality. It's quite strange, actually. Like, I, I'd holidayed so much or I'd summered so much that, like, when you were talking about what you do in season versus out of season, it kind of made – it resonated with, like, I had such a busy summer. My girlfriend's – so many friends. There was always something happening. Never so much time to myself that after all that, I was like, I'm done. Just – I'm going to stay in this room for about a week. Yeah. Like maybe two weeks. And now when they have more like <laughs> social events, I sit, I almost go out thinking like, I think I'll leave by about 10.30. That, that'll be great. I can come home. I can maybe yeah. play some guitar. I can maybe watch some. You, you know you're done when you're already looking. <laughs> Seriously. But uh, I, was there, oh, there was one thing that I wanted to raise in, in, in regards to when you went walking, because I loved how you talked about life. You just wandered. Yeah. And it brought me to a thought that I had for myself yeah. around the journey versus the destination. And it was like, we need to focus on the journey. Like the journey needs to be where we live. Because if we're stuck at the de- in, in the destination, we're essentially living in the future. And I loved this idea yeah. of just going for a wander. And I had this for my running as well. Because a lot of the times when you run as an athlete, there's an end goal. I want to run my 5K, my 2K, 100 meter, yeah. et cetera, whatever it is, as fast as possible. And I found myself almost like hitting walls where I might run a 5K or a 2K or, or something to be like, I couldn't really push past it. I started wondering why we're yeah. so focused on this destination, all my energy is going to like getting to this point, that anywhere beyond it, I'm almost like now taking outside of what my mind thinks I'm capable of. And I came up with this fun little quote that was like, the mm-hmm. mind can't define what the body hasn't experienced. Same way for say, intimate connection, yeah. you might say, the uh-huh. mind can't define what the heart hasn't experienced. You know, 
And I've had a lot of people talk about long distance. Oh, I could never do that. It's like, wait until you find someone that makes you go, you know what? I'm, blue, I'm willing to give it a crack. And then come back to me and tell me if you still can't do it. But the body thing, I'm losing it again. I thought was really interesting where like, I just went for a jog once after having not, not, not jogged in a while. And I was really surprised at how far I actually ran just working on this journey component, just being present in the moment. Yeah. And that was quite touching, I think, just to hear. I feel like I haven't even had to ask any questions. You've just, like, talked everything for me. <laughs> what I would say was I'll just – the reason why I like using this platform is that it records your audio on your end on your computer and then it uploads it. It does the same thing on my end. So yeah. there's no buffering because, like, even if, say, you couldn't hear me, I'd still be able to okay. hear you clearly. Um, and so – I love the fact that I can do this. What I can just do is like, just put your audio up and just, it's just you chatting for like, you know, a good hour and a half. <laughs> Brilliant. I've taken over your podcast. <laughs> you, know, you know what? What do, what, what, what do they call it when, you know, a pro, you know, someone takes over that takes over the channel and does like a day in the life of, you know, Katie, etc. What happens in my day? What would be a day in the life <laughs> of you? Wake up at 10, 11 morning coffee. Oh, no, a little bit earlier. I don't like, so I like to sleep. I don't like to waste the day. It's a fine good. balance. It is a fine balance. So, are you someone, can I ask yeah, a quick depends. question? So are you, are you someone that like, if you don't yeah. achieve something in a day, you feel like the day has been, you might say a failure in a way, like I have to accomplish something each day. I, I used to be terrible. And then I've, as I've sort of, as I really, I think COVID was a bonus because she actually couldn't do right. much. So if it was like just putting a wash on and, you know, hanging it out like that, that's a win. Um, so I think there's just little things. Like if you're just functioning, <laughs> that's, that's, really that's a good, good thing. So, you know, after, after this, well, there's just sometimes like today, right? Like I'm chatting yeah. to you, but then like the rest, it's my day off. So I train mm. on a Monday and a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday. And I do a, a little bit of, just, you know, extra, but don't tell them on a Saturday. You can't I say that. Moving, you know, two days in a row. I'm not doing if they that. listen to the podcast. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Whoopsie daisy. So, okay. I've got about, you know, I'll just be like, oh. my 60 or 70 listeners, you know, just keep that to yourself. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. I've, I've had a pretty good conversation with the SNC. So, like, the rest of the day today, like, I've literally, I've got to put a wash on. I'm going to go yeah. shopping and buy some food, like, for the rest of the week. Like, there's, you know what, there's not much to the rest mm. of the day. So, I'm going to get some steps in doing all that and pottering. But, like, that's my, quite a good word for me. Sometimes I get... Like my mum will go, oh, what are you doing today? I'll be like, oh, like, I'm just going to pot it. And she's a bit like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I've just got a few bits and bobs to do, but like, I know that like that's a good that's yeah. a good day today. And then like, so like yesterday, I left the house at 11 and I got back at, I mean, there was a bit of traffic, like maybe quarter to seven, half mm. six. And like, that was a big day. Training, got my running done, got cricket done, got gym done, mm. came home. And like that's a big day I've achieved that, but I can't do yeah. that every day. And I think once I realised that I can't, there's actually small wins because like I'm not just a professional mm. cricketer. Like I'm meant to be an adult, and you know sometimes <laughs> do better than, and then sometimes I do worse. And like actually just functioning and doing some good things, like keeping the yeah. house tidy and cleaning, which I hate. I hate cleaning. Like that's that's a win in itself because you know that's I've got something out of the day and. Whether, you know, like if I'm going out for dinner on Thursday night, like that's a nice thing to look forward to. And, you know, that's a good thing to do that day. Like, I think once you get into this obsession of, like, oh, this is a quiet day, yeah. but actually days like this are quite yeah. important so that you can then hit Wednesday, Thursday, Friday energised and you're not sort of like thinking, oh, God, when's the end yeah. of the week coming? So I think whether... And it's a fine balance, trust me. I've, I've had a good battle with sort of just letting these days be these days and, you know, making sure that, like, doing some washing mm. is enough. God, I sound like such a <laughs> bit. Um, but, yeah, I think it's important. I think, I think yeah, it's just, it's whatever it is, like, I wrote a couple of notes on, I did, so it's my first time I had a bowl yesterday since yeah. the end of the summer, so I've had some time off, as everyone has done. And I wrote a few notes about that this morning while I was drinking mm -hmm. my coffee. So like that's like that's a good thing, but it's a very small mm -hmm. thing, you know. And for someone else, it might be that they've got taken their dog for a walk, yeah. like whatever it is. Like it's you're still achieving something. If you stay in bed all day, like maybe you need to. Like, yeah. Are you okay? 
but like other than that you're fine you can't you can't achieve massive things every day no and like training every day as well that's that's something where like you know to 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 like how did i phrase my equation it's like training plus recovery equals adaptation it's like to to create a positive adaptation yeah. like you need both variables and uh I think, you know, that that's where like training smart versus training hard, like train hard within a smart program. And then also yeah. like train smart while you're training hard. So like you were kind of mentioning, like sometimes you could go a lot harder, but you've yeah. decided it's smarter to like hold back a little bit. And I think. Um, yeah. And I think that's the big thing I've realized is that sometimes if you just plow through, like you're just taking more bits out of you that have got to recharge. Mm. And if you, you know, run that too empty, like how long is it going to take to recharge? And I think when you find it like that mm. and you sort of think of it like that, you actually, you stop seeing it as this one big thing. Like you've said about sort of a journey and a destination. And you know that because I've only done two sets in the gym today, that's actually putting me in the best place forward for sort of just going again. And I think it's the way you look at things mm. is, the, is like the most important thing you can do. Definitely. I think that's great. Your, your like perception and how you're and, and your awareness of yourself. And this has been great, like really enjoyable to kind of like hear, hear you talk about all these kinds of things, essentially without me even needing to ask the questions that I feel are um, important to ask. So no, nah, I really appreciate you coming on and having this chat because it's been a, oh, I've just found myself like just sitting here smiling and laughing for the Thank first like <laughs> hour or so. And uh, the way that I have wanted to run. Always a good start. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but the, again, the way that I have wanted to run this podcast is, is, is just a chat, but like an ongoing chat. So I'll definitely be pinging you a message in, you know, when I probably, I'll be curious to probably midway through the summer or something because I'll be curious to give you a bit of time to, you know, work on some stuff, but, uh, but yeah, um, just one final thing is that that little like mushroom thingy at the top that says like probably 99 or something like that. What on this thing? Yeah. So like how, 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 how I usually need to end the cause is first have to like stop the recording. Um, then you'll have to stay on for a little bit while it finishes okay. uploading and then you're allowed okay. to go. Yeah. So I'll probably just, clip this last okay, bit cool. out and I'll just say like a really professional like I really appreciate you Katie that was really kind of you to come on but you can do yeah, one thanks. thing quickly and just like you know say like a, a real cheesy kind of like really appreciate your stuff so you get help helping me with the best drills to you know bowl you know 125 or something something ridiculous like that that I can mini clip <laughs> <laughs> and I can chuck as a little humorous kind of mini trailer Do you want me yeah. to do that now? Appreciate you, Stubbsy. Thank you for those couple little drills that are going to help me out, I think, over this winter. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks, Katie.